So I want to start off today by telling you a story about an experience that I had early in my career. When I first got out of college, uh, I actually ended up working for the U.S. Army. Now, to be clear, I was not some kind of soldier or anything like that. I wasn't enlisted. I was a software engineer working at the Army's video game studio. <laughs> yeah, pretty much the opposite of most people's experience with the U.S. Army. I was building educational apps. Uh, here's a picture from me at that time. This was many, many years ago. You can tell that I am clearly not a soldier of any kind in this picture. I'm just a kid fresh out of college, ready to start my career as a web developer. But at the game studio, I had a unique talent in that I was the only software engineer that knew how to build single-page web applications with JavaScript. So in a weird twist of fate, even though I was fresh out of college, I suddenly became the lead JavaScript engineer for a big social media app written in AngularJS. Yikes. <laughs> this was a stressful time for me. I may have known JavaScript, but I certainly didn't know how to architect big AngularJS applications. So myself and my team of engineers, we sort of got to working, and over the course of a year, we managed to cobble together just this mess of an AngularJS application with the wild dependency graph of services and controllers. But we eventually got the application working. And we finished it. We managed to deliver the application on time, and that application is still used today. And while this might sound like a success story, there's actually a bit of a dark side to this. Because while it's still being used today, it hasn't been updated in the five years since it's been deployed. <laughs> so what went wrong here? Well, there's a couple of things that I know went wrong after I left the project. The first was that the application was seriously hard to debug. We're talking about hard to find race conditions and HTTP requests, no clear assignment of responsibility across the code, and some really bad promise based code. I did not know what promises were when I started. This made it really hard to trace data changes. It wasn't clear if data was coming from services or sometimes it was coming from controllers and my components. It was just kind of a mess of data all using you know, some mixture of a bad event bus on dollar scope. And of course, like any first time project, there were not nearly enough unit tests. It was hard to make changes to this brittle code base because you had no guarantee that it was gonna work correctly. So when I left this application, I really left the app sinking in a tar pit of complexity. There's a reason it wasn't updated in five years. It was too difficult for developers to maintain this code base after we built it. So my name is Mike Ryan. You can find me on GitHub, Twitter, and Medium at Mike Ryan Dev. I'm a software architect at Synapse working on the industrial internet of things. I'm also a Google developer expert in Angular and web technologies and a core team member of the NGRX project. The NGRX project was founded by uh, Angular core team member, Rob Wormald, with the purpose of providing open source libraries for Angular with a specific emphasis on reactivity. We wanted to leverage RxJS to make the Angular development story a little bit better. We're primarily known for handling state management and side effects in your application. We provide a framework and an architecture for handling state in Angular applications. And it's also completely community driven. If you want to get involved in the NGRX project, you can just get on our on our GitHub repository, open an issue and start working. We have a wonderful team of volunteers that will help guide you to making your first contribution to NGRX. So from that project many years ago, I learned that I did not know how to manage complexity. But I think I have a few insights on how you can manage complexity now using NGRX. There's a really lovely paper called Out of the Tar Pit by Ben Mosley and Peter Marks where they identify that complexity is the single major difficulty in the successful development of large scale software. Before I unpack this though, I kind of wanted to find, well, what is a large scale application? I know I've caught myself at many conferences before saying, oh, NGRX is only for large scale apps. And I know it's kind of a common idea that Angular itself is only for large scale apps. But what does this actually mean? For me, large scale is kind of a function of the size of your team and the amount of time you spend on the project. For example, if you're a solo developer or work on a small team and you're only working on that project for a small amount of time, probably not a large scale software. But if you take that solo developer or that small team and ask them to work a little bit longer, maybe this project is gonna last a year, suddenly the application size grows relative to the size of the team. And if that team continues to grow or if the amount of time you spend on it continues to grow, suddenly you've got what I'd consider to be a large scale software, regardless of the size of the team. I just wanna point out that all software is hard. It's not that large scale software is somehow special. It just happens to have a unique problem set in terms of maintainability and onboarding new developers. 
So when I say that complexity is the single major difficulty in the successful development of large-scale software, you can also experience complexity problems at all sizes and scales. It just happens to be really important for those kinds of projects. So where does this complexity come from? Well, a major contributor to this complexity is primarily state, along with code volume and complex control flow. What do these terms mean, and how does NGRX maybe address some of these? So let's talk about how might you manage state, code volume, and control flow with NGRX in your Angular applications. And the first I want to talk about is state. So who here has had this experience where you're using some app or some website and something goes wrong, and your friend or maybe your coworker tells you, oh, try that again, it didn't work the first time. Refresh the page. I'm sure it'll work after the cache is cleared. Oh, you need to try turning the machine off and on again. That'll get it working. Or even more nefariously, just delete the application and reinstall it from the App Store. Yeah, we've all encountered these kinds of problems with applications. And it's really not cool, but it's kind of a difficult problem because many systems have errors in the way they handle state. If you've had to restart an application or delete it to get it working again or clear the cache, that was a state problem. That application wasn't maintaining state correctly. So if we want to build large-scale applications with Angular, we need to have a deliberate strategy for how we're going to handle state. And that's where NGRX might come into play. So for this, I'm going to steal an example from my friend Lucas Rubelkeep, because I think it perfectly illustrates the way we've evolved to think about state and UI applications over the past few years. So I don't know how many of you have written jQuery code, but I've certainly written this kind of code before. And in this code, there's state around whether or not a modal window is open. And that state is deeply intertwined with the template. Also here is the behavior for how that state changes. This code might have worked when it was just this amount of code you had to write, but when you built large applications this way, it really turned into a mess. And that's because state and the way it changed and the view itself were all tightly coupled. It was kind of a mess of responsibility, a hodgepodge of code. So along comes AngularJS, and they kind of have a solution to this problem. Let's separate the template from state and behavior. And they introduced this notion of controllers. So we can have a controller maintain both the state and the way the state changes, and our HTML lives separately. And this introduced the first bit of separation between our view layer and our application state. But of course, we continue to evolve this concept. We still have behavior and state living pretty close to our template, and our components have to know a lot about those services. So we introduce the concept of services to try and lift that even higher out of our application. In many Angular apps, we have services to maintain our state and how that state changes. And again, we've moved state further away from the template code. We now have the template in our view, behavior in our components, and then we also still have some behavior and state in our service layer. But we want to really decouple behavior, the way state changes, and state itself, the data of our application. And this is where NGRX comes in. NGRX gives you a primitive building block for maintaining state called reducer functions. Reducer functions take in these events in your application that we call actions. When it sees an action that it cares about, it makes some update to state. And what's great about this is now we've got a clear declarative description of how state changes for the events in your application. There's no behavior here. We're not calling out to any services. It's very far away from your template. Your components don't have to know about the internal mechanisms of the state container. And now we've lifted our state out of our services and it's far away from our view layer. And in doing so, we've encapsulated the responsibility of how state changes to just one module of code. But Indirex gets even crazier than that. NGRX has this idea of feature modules, allowing you to encapsulate a group of state into a single NG module. And now we can share application state across applications even. We could take our state, lift it out of our app, and share it maybe across with an Ionic app, or a PWA, or any other kind of application that we'd want to with shared state. Another benefit of this approach is that our state becomes testable. Because we've really reduced the responsibility down to just one module of code, it becomes easier to write tests that verify this code is behaving correctly. Because we don't have to mock anything out, and all the state functions are clear, descriptive ways of how state changes. So how does NGRX help you maintain state? Well, we're decoupling it from behavior and lifting it as far away from the template as possible. We make changes to state deterministically using reducer functions. 
And this all gives us a very straightforward testing strategy to verify that our state transitions work correctly. So NGRX is one way to help you get out of the tar pit for managing complex application state. But what about code volume? Some of you might have heard that NGRX has a bit of a reputation here. So code volume is simply how many lines of code it takes to complete a task. Here's a screenshot of an AngularJS application I have written where I'm on line, I don't think you can see it too well, but I'm on line like 2200 in this single file and there's 15 other files used to maintain this and it's just a mess. And too much code means slower development. If it's gonna take me twice as much code with one technology over another to complete a task, then I'm only half as productive with that technology. So how does code volume get addressed with NGRX? Well, I have to be honest with you here. NGRX doesn't really address this very well. NGRX has what many of you have called a boilerplate problem. And it's kind of true, but it's also kind of half untrue too. You see, NGRX increases code volume to help you manage state and control flow. It's absolutely gonna increase the number of lines of code you have to write, but in doing so, it's easier to manage those other two concerns or inputs to complexity. I also wanna point out that it's not really boilerplate. If it was boilerplate, we could write abstractions for you over it, and it's hard to write abstractions when it's really just explicit code. We're asking you to be explicit about the events that arise in your application, the way state responds to it, and the way services start. So I don't want you to think about NGRX in terms of code costs, or I want you to think about it in terms of code costs, but not in terms of boilerplate. Are you willing to pay the cost in using NGRX if it makes maintaining state and managing complex control flow easier? We're also really working to address this on the NGRX team. So in NGRX 8, we've made a number of changes to try and improve the amount of code it takes for you to write an NGRX application. So beforehand, where it may have taken you this much amount of code to write just three actions, with the new create action function, we've reduced it to a much smaller body of code to get started more quickly. And we've done the same thing for reducer functions, where it used to take a lot of setup with a reducer function and a switch statement and handling different case statements and uh, annotating your types. Now, using create reducer, we've made that code a lot smaller, allowing you to be more productive more quickly. So yes, NGRX has a boilerplate problem, but really think of it in terms of code cost. And just be aware that on the NGRX team, we're aware of it. And NGRX 8 tries to directly address the code volume problem by introducing new functions and helper utilities to make the amount of code you have to write smaller. So that brings us to the last input to complexity in an NGRX application, and that is control flow. Control flow is the order of execution in your application. How do you get from one state to another? What has to happen for you to get there? Is it some HTTP requests? Is it calls to services, calls to local storage? All this and the order in which it operates is the control flow of your Angular application. So remember that tangle of services I showed you earlier that I wrote early in my career? It was hard to trace the control flow in this application. It was not easy for, for a new developer to come into the code base and know where something started and where something ended. And this is a problem because applications that have unclear control flow are going to be harder to change. If you're a new developer coming to this application and you have to add some new feature to an already existing system, it can be really confusing to know where to start. This is not gonna help you maintain this application. Even worse, perhaps, is that bad control flow can lead to nefarious race condition bugs. If you're not explicit in the way something starts or stops, then you might not have control over it starting and might have multiple processes running at the same time. So how does NGRX address control flow? And to me, this is one of the most exciting parts of NGRX. So I showed you this authentication reducer earlier, and this was a description of how state changes when certain events arise. But control flow needs to be the way that we actually have these events arise in our application. That's the behavior, the behavior of how things change. And we isolate behavior in an NGRX application in a module of code called effects. And I need to warn you, it's gonna get kind of brain bendy here. This is most developers' first experience with effects where things <laughs> come right back to hurt them. But once you dive into them, they actually have some pretty neat characteristics. So where do effects live in this? Well, we have our view layer now, and it's completely decoupled from the way state is changing, which is managed by our reducers. And effects kind of live off on their own. 
There are these isolated processes that run in parallel to the rest of your Angular application. And they're gonna be the ones that are gonna communicate with the outside world. They're gonna communicate with your service layer or they're gonna communicate with some asynchronous browser API. This is where behavior is isolated. So what do these look like? Well, they're written with observables. And they actually start off with using a special observable service called the actions service. And this action service is an observable of all of the actions or events that arise in your application. It uses the special operator coming from NGRXFX called the of type operator. Using this operator, it can listen for specific events in your application. Once an event occurs, it can use RxJS to map to the behavior you want to capture with this effect. In this case, it's using a movie service to capture an HTTP request that it's going to make to the server. When this service completes, it's going to map the result into a new action. And what's really cool is once this new action is dispatched, another effect can listen for it, or many reducers can listen for that action to make some kind of state change. You can, com you can uh, nest or isolate behaviors and connect them using actions. So effects allow you to model complex control flow using observables. Using idiomatic RxJS, you can describe when and how behavior starts in your application. And what's great is since this is idiomatic Rx, you have a lot more control over how race conditions or isolating race conditions or preventing them altogether. You can use the right operator for the right effect to make sure that you're choosing the right cancellation strategy for your service calls. So what are effects? Well, in an Indrex application, these are processes that are running in the background of your Angular application. They're decoupled from your components and from your reducers. They're primarily responsible for connecting your application to the outside world. In effects, this is where you talk to your service layer. This is where you make HTTP requests or open up a WebSocket connection. We often use effects to talk to services. Services don't disappear. They just become a little bit more smaller. And effects are the ones that talk to services, not components. And they're written entirely using RxJS streams. If you know Rx, you can start being productive with effects today. And this allows you to avoid race conditions and other nasty behavior. So NGRX gets you out of the tar pit of managing control flow logic by giving you a powerful toolkit with effects for managing complex behavior. So what is the way out of the tar pit? We've talked about maintaining complex state, managing control flow, and code volume. And I posit that NGRX is one way to get out of the, out of the tar pit. It's designed for large applications. Because of that code volume problem, it's only going to really make sense on teams that have the resources to build with it. It maintains state by fully decoupling it from behavior. You maintain state and reducer functions that are descriptions of how state changes for when particular actions arise. It's going to increase code volume. You need to be aware of this. You're going to write more code in an NGRX application than if you were not using NGRX. But this trade-off might be worth it if you're interested in trying to maintain complex state transitions or control flow. And we model control flow using observables giving us a powerful toolkit to isolate behavior, maintain race conditions, and decouple behavior from our components in our state. And I really want to emphasize that first point one more time. NGRX is well suited for large scale applications. Because it increases code volume, you need to be aware that it's going to take more time and consideration to build an NGRX app successfully. If you're building a medium to small sized application with Angular, NGRX may be a good fit for you, but it's also worth considering alternatives like Akita at NGXS. So how will you climb out of the tar pit? The next time you start architecting your Angular application, what architectural decisions are you going to make to make sure that you, are, you have a framework for maintaining straight transitions, or for managing complex control flow, or for making sure that the code volume is not too great that your team can't be productive with it? Thank you. <laughs>